This past Thursday commemorated the ascension of Jesus into heaven. It was after 40 days uh, since his resurrection that he had spent time with the disciples, teaching them and uh, remaining in physical fellowship with them. And then he ascended into the heavens. Now, this story is told twice in our Bible, uh, both times by the same author, Luke. Uh, so I'll begin by sharing with you Luke's account uh, in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 24, of how this ascension took place. Jesus said to the disciples, This is what I meant by saying, while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and in the prophets and Psalms was bound to be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. So you see, he said, that scripture foretells the sufferings of the Messiah and his rising from the dead on the third day, and declares that in his name repentance bringing the forgiveness of sins is to be proclaimed to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. You are to be witnesses to it all. I am sending on you the gift promised by my Father. Wait here in the city until you are armed with power from above. Then he led them out as far as Bethany, and he blessed them with uplifted hands, and in the act of blessing he parted from them, and they returned to Jerusalem full of joy and spent all their time in the temple praising God. It's a fantastic story from the end of Luke's Gospel, the story of when Jesus ascended bodily to be at his Father's right hand. It is such a fantastic story that some have doubted. Uh, some have thought that Luke made it up to explain why Jesus wasn't around uh, for the early Christians. Uh, he had risen from the dead, but, you know, many years later, he's nowhere to be seen. So what happened? Some people think that Luke made up that story to explain the absence of Jesus. On that point, I wanted to consult an author who I appreciate dearly. His name is Robert Ferrer Capon, and in his book, Kingdom, Grace, Judgment, he looks at parables, and he says uh, about the ascension, we have something parabolic going on, but he doesn't want us to dismiss the story of the ascension as purely a parable, something purely made up. And here's what he has to say about uh, this. He is referring to critics who think that Luke made up this story. The critics I refer to usually say something like this. In Jesus' time, people thought that heaven was literally up. We, however, having abandoned the flat earth theory, know that it is not a place at all, at least not one you can reach by traveling from here to there. Thus, they argue, the story of the ascension was probably made up by Luke or somebody to provide a suitably parabolic interpretation of the obvious fact that Jesus wasn't around anymore after the great 40 days. I have a number of objections to that kind of fast and loose shuffle. The first is this. If the critics are willing to give Luke credit for being bright enough to think up the parable of the ascension, why are they unwilling to give Jesus credit for having the same cleverness and the ability to act it out. The answer, of course, is that they have a prejudice against miracles and will do almost anything to avoid having to posit one as a legitimate historical event. They are entitled to that prejudice, but they are not, for my money, entitled to put it forth as a piece of biblical criticism. The ascension just sits there on the pages of Luke, obstinately refusing to get out of the text. They don't have to like it, but they should do everyone the favor of acknowledging that their dislike is based on an a priori philosophical judgment and not on scripture itself. My second objection proceeds from that. The veneer of scientific respectability they put up on their argument, meaning heaven can't possibly just be up. This is another dodge. Of course heaven isn't up, but if you are going to act out a cosmically significant departure, you have, even in our 21st century, a choice of only three directions, up, down, or sideways. Of those, only up has the parabolic significance you're after. Down implies the exact opposite of what you want to symbolize, 
and sideways makes people think that you only have moved to Grand Rapids. Finally, it seems silly for these debaters to mention the flat earth round earth controversy. Their whole argument attacks only a straw man. Whatever your view of terrestrial or celestial mechanics, neither scripture nor sound theology requires you to get Jesus any further spatially than the first cloud. After that, the ascension as an event in this world is over, and the cosmic significance of it becomes, as it was meant to be all along, the main thing. So I am perfectly happy to take the ascension as an event, and I am equally comfortable trying to plumb its parabolic significances to my heart's content. The two activities do not conflict in any way. Indeed, they absolutely require each other. If you insist on the ascension as a mere happening, you miss its meaning. If you only harp on its meaning, you cut it off from history, which is the only arena in which God has revealed to us, parabol parabolically or otherwise, his purpose. I really like that author. I really like how he lifts up the ascension both as an event and as something that teaches us, something that has parabolic meaning. Saying that the ascension has parabolic meaning to us, that it teaches us a lesson or two, is not the same thing as saying it was made up or that it didn't happen. God works in history. We know this through Jesus Christ, who was born in the first century and was killed by the political rulers of the first century um, and ascended in the first century. Now, I wanted to read to you uh, Luke's second telling of uh, the ascension because I think it speaks to us on exactly uh, what, the, what the ascension means. And I think it's an important thing for us to consider. This is from Acts chapter one. Acts was also written by Luke, it's the same author. When they were all together, they asked Jesus, Lord, is this the time at which you are to restore sovereignty to Israel? He answered, it is not for you to know about dates or times which the Father has set within his own control but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you will bear witness for me in Jerusalem and throughout all Judea and Samaria and even in the farthest corners of the earth. After he had said this, he was lifted up before their very eyes and a cloud took him from their sight. They were gazing intently into the sky where he stood and all at once there stood beside them two men robed in white who said, men of Galilee, why stand there looking up into the sky? This Jesus who has been taken from you up to heaven will come in the same way you have seen him go. Acts chapter one. There are some things I love about this story, uh, especially the telling in the book of Acts. I think there are some details that really enrich it and um, get at what's going on in the ascension. The first thing that I love is that Jesus tells the apostles that he is sending them into the whole world to spread the news of his resurrection, the gospel of new life through Jesus Christ. They are to go to all the ends of the earth to share this news. And then he ascends into heaven and the apostles stand there staring to where Jesus was. It takes these two angels robed in white to kind of give them a kick in the butt, and then later on, uh, actually in the lesson we'll read uh, next Sunday, the Holy Spirit's gonna come and light tongues of fire on their heads to send them out, and that's uh, really the, the final push um, that gets them into gear to spread the good news of Jesus Christ. But I just love that imagery of Jesus saying, you need to go to all these places, and the disciples stand there and they stare at where Jesus was. And that's a danger for you and me, isn't it? That uh, we miss where we are called to go because we fix our gaze on where we have experienced the presence of Jesus Christ. Um, we see this in camping ministry or in youth ministry. Uh, we are always trying to encourage those who participate, those who work at youth events or serve as camp counselors, those who come as youth or as campers, uh, for all the wonderful experiences that we have in those ministries, it's what happens afterwards uh, that's at least as important, 
if you spend all your time pining to be back at camp or back at a youth event or back at a retreat, you've kind of missed the point. Uh, we have these special times in our lives where we experience the presence of Jesus, uh, but we have to carry that out into the world or we've possibly missed the point. Well, of course, this is on my mind a great deal because I think about how uh, I usually experience the Jesus of Christ. I usually experience the presence of Jesus Christ in the midst of our community gathered here, especially on Sunday morning or throughout the week for additional services. And I'm not experiencing that right now. And I cannot wait for us to gather in person again. I miss you all terribly. But if that's the only place where I am fixing my eyes, if I am only looking intently for that time when we are gathered in person again, then I am missing how God is calling me now. And so I hope that you join me in not just uh, looking for that uh, special time ahead when we can finally gather as we used to. Um, I hope you're also looking around you and seeing how God is calling you to both uh, worship him now, uh, even though we can't gather here in person, and serve your neighbor now, and tell your neighbor or other members of your household about Jesus. Uh, we have a calling here and now and uh, we are missing the uh, gathering that normally happens here at our church, uh, but we are still sent uh, by the God who calls us. His Holy Spirit is with you. The presence of Jesus Christ is with you. Uh, God the Father has promised that you belong to him for all eternity, and that therefore we all are in this together even when we can't gather in one place. Uh, I hope that the message of the Ascension for you and for me is not to see where, not to look where Jesus was, but to, to see where Jesus is. Uh, he is at the right hand of the Father, and that means he oversees the entire world, and that's where our calling is. Hope you will join me in looking for him there and serving him there, especially as he shows up in our neighbors in need. God bless you. Amen.